I'm a Texan. My father was a Texan. He was raised near uh, the, uh, he was raised in East Texas in the Piney Woods out in the country. His, uh, his mother's milk was not good when he was born. And there was a wet nurse down the road who was an African-American woman named Texana Gillum. Now, I'm not going to pretend this was some great moment of justice. It wasn't. But Texana Gillum suckled my father for the first year or so of his life. And uh, Daddy loved her. And she lived about a quarter mile away all the time he was growing up. And I suspect she, she at least half raised him. Anyhow, he loved her and determined he had named his first child Texana. Uh, I came along with the wrong plum plumbing, and he, uh, <laughs> he just changed it to text. But it is my baptized name, and uh, it's, uh, that's really it. Uh, Texans think I'm trying to steal their thunder, and I always assure them I wasn't named after the state. So. <laughs> I worked my way through college in the oil field. We had a small field out west of my hometown called the Brookhaven Field. And I never shall forget that early on that first summer, we laid a pipeline, just a small two-inch pipeline. In the oil field, in my experience, you always lay a pipeline in eight inches of water. And the reason is, is because you wear, you know, six-inch boots. <laughs> you, load, you load these joints of pipe. This one was going to be only about a quarter of a mile long. You load up enough pipe on a truck to go that distance and drive out to the place. And of course, you're always at the edge of a swamp because it just wouldn't be fun if you weren't splashing through a swamp with all those water boxes. You know? so we are laying that pipeline out there. And once you get the pipe down on the ground, then you come along and you do what you call make them up. That means screw them together. And uh, they get a few of those done. and. They, decide it's time for me to uh, stab the pipe. What that means is you stand, the pipe's 20 feet long. As I remember, it weighs about 200 pounds. And uh, they've got the collar, that's the part you screw into, on that end, propped up on a board about a foot high. And your job is to stand on this end and aim that pipe so that it will fit those threads. You understand? And then you've got a small hand wrench which has a bicycle chain or like around that hooks to this wrench. And once you get it stabbed, you turn it gently to make sure you got the threads connected rightly. And then you try to spin it in as far as you can. And then they put the big 36 inch wrenches on it and then they tighten it up. Got the picture? Now the problem is, <laughs> you're standing 20 feet away. You've not done this before. <laughs> You're trying to stab a pipe that bends. The pipe weighs 200 pounds and I weigh 180. So I am struggling and not being very successful. At that point, Snooks Britt, who was always my nemesis, Snooks kind of had a love-hate relationship with me. His favorite name for me was College Boy. <laughs> Spelled out like C O L L I G E, college boy. And uh, as I'm trying to stab that pipe, he shouts at me, College boy, there's a right way to do that, and all the other ways are wrong, and your opinion don't mean a damn thing. Right? That was one of the most dramatic introductions I've ever had to what I call the craft tradition of knowing. <laughs> and you know, he was correct. As a college student, I had a whole lot of opinions, but I didn't know how to do much. I certainly didn't know how to lay pipe. There were thousands of things in the old patch I could not do. There were things I knew about, but things I didn't know how to do. Um, the craft tradition of knowing says that it's very important to know how. It also says this. It says you have to be formed to the object to be known. You can't say to Pipe, believe me, you cannot. You cannot say to Pipe, Pipe, I want you constituted the way I have an opinion of you. You can't work Pipe that way. Uh, it's true so many things. I dare say it could. You've got to be formed 
by that food. Well, there are many ways to be formed by it, to be sure. But formed by it. You can't say to a violin, have eight strings. Mm -hmm. You have to be formed by the object that is to be known. And what Snooks was speaking to, though he would never put it in this language, I think, he was saying to me, your opinion doesn't count here. You are an apprentice. And by God, you've got to learn to work with the pipe. The pipe don't have to learn to work with you. And his experience of people who are college trained <coughs> is that they have a lot of opinions, but they don't have a lot of skills. <laughs> At least oil field skills. Now part of the question is, what are we to learn as people who care about justice, I presume, or you wouldn't be here. What do we have to learn in terms of how we need to be formed as people to do justice? How does justice need to form us rather than we simply come up with a host of opinions? It's so true that a lot of people have positions on issues, but they can't do much about it. Is that true? Does that fit your experience? It reminds me of the guy who read all the sex books. You know? He knew all the positions, but none of the moves. All the positions, but none of the moves. Right? The philosophers talk about this as practical reason. And what practical reason means is reasoning about a practice. Um, we are going through hell right now with our two wine around dogs. Because in the house we previously lived in, there was a, a, a concrete block wall, as they have them in Arizona, all the way around the backyard. We had a doggy door. All you have to do with a dog is you could go in and out at will. You never had to let a dog out. You never had to watch the dog when the dog was out. The dog was contained. Now, we are in a house with no wall. And we have got a 50-foot cable on these dogs to keep them in the yard. But when you take them out, you have to hook a leash. You have to hook a leash which is connected to the cable. Got the picture? Have to, to their collar. Let me tell you about thinking about practice. I never realized that these leashes actually have a... I need to draw you a picture. They've got a hook on them like this. It goes like this. You've seen these things. And then it's got a little piece that comes up here like this. You know what I'm talking about? And, and it's got a little bit of spot in it. But you'll notice this lower half is inclined. What that means is if you are skilled and practiced and have thought about this and you conformed yourself to the latch, you can actually take this loop <laughs> and if you shove it right here, it will actually go in. <laughs> Provided you develop the skills <laughs> to keep that thing in line while the dog is jumping up and down. <laughs> Provided you develop the skills to know how to step on one leash to hold the dog close to the ground so the dog doesn't butt you in the face. <laughs> Provided you learn not to get so excited when you talk to the dog that your excitement contributes to the excitement of the dog. <laughs> Do you understand that the practice of putting a dog on a cable that is used to a concrete block wall is a difficult task <laughs> and it requires practice and practical reason? May I submit to you, if it's that hard to put a dog on a leash, what do you think about justice? <laughs> are, we, are we together? Yeah, we are. So, I think justice requires apprenticeship, too. It requires working with somebody who's done it, and it helps if they've done it a long time. For the last 11 years, I've been heavily involved in community organizing in Phoenix, Arizona. And our lead organizer there is a guy named Joe Rubio, who's an IEF organizer. And I have basically apprenticed myself to Joe for the last 11 years. And it has been one of the richest experiences of my life in that respect. So if you've not 
done much, if you know about a lot but you don't know how, then get next to somebody who does. And that's, that's just crucial. Um, let me say one other thing too about uh, the craft tradition of knowing. We're a consumer culture. It's amazing how permeated we are with consumerism. One of the things that consumer culture does is teach us to crave for experience. And dear God, do they work on adolescents to crave experience, right? especially new experience, because if they get you committed to new experience, they believe they keep selling you new experience. That's one way to think about experience. Think about experience the other way. Think about being experienced in a craft. That's a very different experience. That's experience that is formed, that is trained, that is skilled, that knows how. What happens if all you do is have new experience? Almost nothing. <laughs> I mean, you have a lot of experiences, uh, but you don't have the craft model of experience. So that's where I want to spend the time in this first lecture with you uh, talking about. And then in the next one, we'll turn more directly to a, a justice of common good, if you will. You realize I'm like a rock skipping across water today, so please uh, be gentle. I think one of the first things one needs to remember in terms of the craft tradition of knowing is the necessity of being formed. <clears throat> and in that sense, being formed as a just person. Goethe, the great German literary critic of the last half of the 18th, first part of the 19th century, Goethe had this notion of beholding. And this is the way he talks about beholding. He says, to behold something truly. You have to cultivate your senses. He says you have to fashion your organs of perception. He says you have to enhance your cognitive perception. And then he says it requires the transformation of the self. Think with me for a moment. We often think these are simply physiological processes. But being able to see, hear, taste, touch, smell, those things are profoundly learned. I'm not denying that there's a physiological process there. Of course there is. But they also have to be learned. There was a study of people who had been either blinded from birth or blinded so early on they could not remember ever having seen. These people were selected because their sight could be corrected through a surgical procedure. They did that surgical procedure, and when they took the bandages off, the disappointment of the people was just overwhelming. Because as one woman would later say, when she could, when she had the language connected to the images to make those kind of claims, you know what I'm saying? She said, all I could see was a blur of images. Uh, one woman said, I, I thought my mother was this high because I saw her sitting all the way across the room. She had not learned you know, distance and vision and so forth. The other could not distinguish your sure, yellow blouse on purple, um, I don't know what that is, smock. <laughs> could not distinguish your dark uh, blue or, or black shirt from this yellow shirt. It was a blur. Those kinds of distinctions came with cultural learning. Okay. Our senses are in part cultural, <coughs> form, and shape. How much more is that the case when you begin to get into an arena like justice? Let's take seeing for a moment. <clears throat> to learn to see a situation, to recognize injustice, requires formation. It requires formation. And if you could see it early on in your life, you were extremely fortunate. It means you got raised right by somebody are so wrong by somebody that you saw an alternative to it, all right? That kind of thing. I, I wound up being invited to speak to a national meeting of the disciples in Indianapolis, Indiana. 
It just so happened that an African American pastor in our town, Mac Charles Jones, was also invited to preach to that same uh, meeting. They had us in the right place. They had me lecture at 11 o'clock in the church. And then they had Mac Charles preach at an open air worship service in downtown Indianapolis. Well, Mac Charles, I don't know, 6'4", 5", 300 pounds, just a big man. And, uh, and when he preached, he could ring the chains. The problem was, we had an airplane at 1 o'clock. He quit preaching about 12.20. And uh, by the time we got together, we had 30 minutes to reach an airport that lay 20 minutes away. He and I are hot footing it down this wide sidewalk toward a cab that stands waiting at the corner. As we're hustling down this wall, a homeless man starts coming toward us. He knows who we are. He's got on the thrift store plant riches. He got on the shirt. He got on the overcoat. He's lost something that looks like cheap wine on the overcoat that night. And he said it toward us. He said, Pastors! Have you got a little money? Well, Mac Charles had had an extraordinary ministry with homeless people for some time. And I say, how are we going to make it to the airport if we spend much time with this man? I said, I'm going to slow a half step and see how Mac Charles is. Well, Mac Charles even sped up. He raised both arms. He had on an overcoat. When Mac Charles raised both arms, it blotted out the sun. <laughs> and he just completely engulfs this man in a huge hug. And he says, Brother, you need money, but you really need to eat. We're going to take you to lunch. <laughs> I say to myself, Hi, right, Charles, we're going to miss an airplane. But I kept my mouth shut. So we hustled to that cab. Mac Charles sits down in one half of it. <laughs> and uh, this man and I sit down in the other half. And Mac Charles said to the driver, Driver, head directly for the airport and step on it. And when you go by a fast food place right on the street, you stop. We're taking this man into lunch and wait for us. And that's exactly what he did. Mac Charles and I put together some money. We go in. Mac Charles says to the guy at the register, Here's some money. You feed this man anything in here that he wants and make sure he eats it and then give him the rest of his money. Hmm. He shook his hand, hugged him, and left. Hmm. Right. We made it to that airport in plenty of time. They closed the door on the gate just as I cleared it behind my head. <laughs> I want you to notice something. When we met that homeless man, I saw that man as an obstacle to our getting to the airport. Mac Charles even called him that, but saw him as a brother. It made all the difference in the world. Hear that? That's a capacity to see that has to be formed. It has to be formed. That doesn't happen like an automatic. Look at things like hear, touch, smell, taste. I was particularly interested in the whole question of smell, for example. How do I form? I used to, as a pastor, I'd visit people on the cancer ward. I never got to the place where the smell of cancer in that ward didn't bother me. And I hated myself for that. You know, I said, good God, Sample, grow up. You know, I even asked my physician, what do you do when you're on a cancer ward? The smell. He said, oh, you just learn to turn your nose off. I've never known how to do that. You know, so I, I haven't been forward. But I was curious about this, so John Flowers, some of you know John Flowers. Right? They aren't here. They were here last night. They were a, a small group last night. Um, John Flowers had a, an extraordinary ministry with homeless people in uh, San Antonio, Texas for 12, some 12 years. <coughs> I, I didn't know what to do with smell. So I, I called John on the phone. I said, John, um, I explained what I was doing. And I was talking about how the senses get formed in terms of issues like justice and the rest. I said, 
How, how, how has your own sense of smell, for example, what can you tell me about this? Look, I got a lecture on this next week and I got to have something to say about smell. <laughs> By the way, Constance Clausen's wonderful book on smell is very much worth a read. It's just so rich and dark. Constance Clausen, C L A S S O N O N A N. Uh, you can spell Constance. I think it's C L A S. I think there is a U S S. Constance Clausen. And I can't remember the title, but it's on spell. It's a wonderful book. <coughs> but I asked John. I said, John. Can you help me with, with how your sense of smell has developed? And he said, oh, that's easy. I wanted to hit him over the phone. <laughs> that's easy. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, I learned after a time that if a homeless person is very, you know, is really has trouble with hygiene, and for example, they smell strongly, that often means that that person is not functional. And so you have to respond to that person differently than you would to somebody else. They need a certain kind and a special kind of care and, and respond. He said if somebody is homeless and they don't smell, that means that they're probably pretty functional. He said, of course, you get people all the way in between those two things. But he said, that's how you use smell as, a, as, a, as an instrument of diagnosis and then of how you respond in terms of ministry. Well, I said, hey, that's pretty good. You got anything else, you know? And then he went on. He, he talked about several things. He said, well, first of all, your hearing. He said, part of the problem with most people, he said, not just with homeless people, but with the poor, really the working folks, because most people won't listen to them. They just don't listen to them. They think they already know what's going on and what needs to be done. And so many of us come in posing program instead of finding out what's needed and responding. You know? So he said, Hearing. He says, you know what I find? Ask people to tell you their story. He said, you would be amazed how many people want to tell you their story. Ella Baker, who was a wonderful, uh, I'll probably refer to her again and again, but Ella Baker was a wonderful organizer of the civil rights movement back in the early 60s, work, uh, especially, for example, for a time in Greenwood, Mississippi. They say Charles McDew uh, says that she could sit down and and listen to people that the rest of the society would say didn't count. And she could listen to them for seven hours. Seven, that's a long time to listen. And said that most of that would not be very helpful. But he said Ella Baker could find seven minutes of stuff that was simply priceless. Well, let me tell you, that is a form capacity. And my hunch is, I don't have it. My hunch is most of us have developed. But that capacity to hear. He says touch. He says one of the things I found out, now John became a trusted person, so you need to be careful about boundaries and things like that. But he said, you know, a lot of people don't touch the homeless. And he said what you have to learn to do is to touch people. And of course you'll have to learn how to touch and when and when it's appropriate and when it isn't. But to touch people. He said, to, uh, to see is another thing he said because most people don't see the poor. They're invisible. And so being formed in your capacity to see. What I'm trying to suggest is a whole host of ways in which our senses, and I'm going to use the word sensibility to talk about senses. <coughs> the way in which our senses are formed and shaped to be a just people. Have you had my experience? I have argued myself blind sometimes. Uh, bad word. I have argued myself silly sometimes, characteristic, um, in, which, um, in which I've tried to argue with people about poverty. And I mean, make absolutely no difference whatsoever. And what I finally came to conclude is that if I can't be a part of something that changes the formation, Arguments won't do it. You got to get into some kind of a process that affects formation in order for change in that kind of personality because they didn't have the capacity. It's a failure of capaciousness. All right. Now, so senses are key in terms of formation. Another thing is dispositions. We've got quite a few Methodists in this room, is my hunch. 
And um, Wesley called them tempers. You know, tempers. The way you are disposed. And Wesley argued for a, a, a disposition toward the poor. In fact, Wesley used to say, don't you dare send folk food to the poor. You take food to the poor. Don't you dare send service to the poor. You take food to the poor. In fact, in one of his sermons, his sermons on the Sermon on the Mount, Wesley said that if you do not care for the poor, you're going to burn in hell. <laughs> sometimes, uh, sometimes Wesley was tough. But how do your dispositions are formed? What, what is your bent? What is your inclination? In Wesley's terms, what is your temperament? Uh, do you know Congressman John Lewis? Uh, he's sometimes called the conscience of the Congress. He has the reputation of being the most beaten person in the history of the Civil Rights Movement back in the 60s, early 70s. Uh, John Lewis did a, uh, a biography, here, an autobiography here a while back. And I was very intrigued by, uh, by a discussion he has when he was put in charge of the chickens. His family lived on a small farm. They had no running water, no electricity. They rode a mule-drawn uh, wagon to, to church on Sunday. And when he was uh, six years old, the family put him in charge of taking care of the chicken. Right. And he says this, here are the, here are the dispositions. The chicken seemed so defenseless, so simple, so pure. There was a subtle grace and dignity in their every movement, at least through my hands. But no one else saw them that way. To my parents, brothers, and sisters, the chickens were just about the lowest form of life on the farm. Stupid, smelly nuisances, awkward, comical birds, good for nothing but laying eggs and providing meat for the table. He goes on. Maybe it was their outcast status. The very fact that those chickens were so forsaken by everyone else that drew me to them as well. I felt as if I had been trusted to care for God's chosen preachers. Lewis goes on to say that he thinks his concern and care for the chickens was the first indication <clears throat> of, as he says, what would come to shape my character and eventually guide me into the heart of the civil rights movement. Qualities I certainly could not name at the time, such as patience, compassion, nonviolence, civil disobedience, and not a little bit of willful stubbornness. Uh, that, that way of forming one's bent one's inclination. Then as I was trying to suggest when I introduced this topic, skill. Skill becomes utterly crucial. If all you ever do is have a position and one doesn't get engaged as an apprentice, those skills typically don't happen. Our son's birthday was August this is a year ago, August uh, 12th, right? Um, yeah. Oh. <laughs> and anyhow, we had him and his daughter out, and, uh, and uh, Peggy and I uh, decided we'd have some really nice steak. And we, she likes, what's that fish? Uh, salmon. Salmon. She likes uh, steak and salmon. I believe if you're eating salmon, you just don't have anything else to in the house. <laughs> <laughs> we got a steak and we got salmon and we got some uh, some chicken, you know. So I've been out there. What I'm really good at is burning food. So I've been out on the grill burning food, uh, burning the meat, you know. And we got a wine around a dog named Jazz. The other's named Blue. And Jazz is an extraordinarily intelligent dog. I have never seen a dog who knows so many ways to frustrate you. <laughs> but if you go out of door, she will figure out where you're coming back. And she will lie down across that path so that you inevitably have to engage her to come again. Now this is not a dog who receives no attention, all right? 
But I come back in, I've got this big platter of meat. And it's here. And I cannot see the floor. And as I'm walking across the kitchen, where the end of the counter is, and there's a corner of a wall over here, I turn to make the move into the, you know, the, the space of the kitchen. And I catch her with my toe on my right foot. And it throws me forward. And there was this corner. And I'm able to break my fall with this forearm. I catch it here. I have a lump about that big for two or three weeks. And I have a bruise from my elbow all the way to my wrist. But I break the fall, and I've got this pan of meat, and I hold that pan of meat out. I fall flat on my chest. I do manage, by the breaking my fall, to keep from hitting my face. But I fall flat, and I've got the meat here. I get up. Peggy says, are you all right? I said, I'm fine. Are you all right? I'm fine. I, I lay the meat down on the <coughs> counter beside the sink, and I put my hands on the border of the sink. And I'm just standing there thinking. <laughs> Peggy says, are you all right? I told you I'm all right. I'm fine. I just hit my elbow. Well, you don't look all right. You look like you're in shock. I'm not in shock. I'm thinking. It shows you how I saw the <laughs> I said, I can't understand why I didn't drop the meat. <laughs> and she said, what do you mean you didn't drop? I said, I held on. Why didn't I drop the meat? The woman just doesn't understand. <laughs> and I'm saying, I'm trying to figure, why didn't I drop the meat? You know. And then I remember. See, I was a pitcher in high school and college. But in college, we only played two games a week. And so what that means is that if you were a pitcher, you didn't get to play the second game. Well, our catcher left school, and I figured out, hey, I can catch. So I started catching so I could play, play the second game a week. See? So I started catching. One of the things you have to learn to do when you're a catcher is to hold the ball when you get hit. All right? um, now, there are ways that they train you to do this, and we need to be thinking about justice in these terms. All right. One of the ways is that they will throw you a soft toss. Why a soft toss? Because a soft toss is harder to catch than a hard toss. And as soon as that ball hits your glove, you know, somebody is over here with a big pillow. And they time it so that when the ball hits your glove, they hit you with that pillow, with just everything they got. So, bam! You know, so it's catch, bam, catch, bam! You, you got the picture? What are you, what are you doing? You are learning the skill of increasing your grip rather than relaxing your grip when you get hit. I caught 35 years. I dropped four balls. And I can remember every ball I ever dropped. All right? You got the picture? So skill is key. How do we learn that kind of skill? I remember the civil rights movement when we would get into some situation that might be violent, the kind of training that went on in terms of remaining non-violent. You know, sometimes you have people right in your face calling you everything in the world but a child of God. You know, sometimes people would be not not exactly hitting you but pummeling you uh, softly, gently, and uh, you, you learn to, if somebody one person get hit, you cover that person, keep covering people. Where? You know, wear them down, but learning skills. Where do we learn skills to do justice? In uh, mass based organizing, you're constantly working on skills, constantly working on relational skills. How do you form relationships with people? How do you surface what are real issues with people? Those are all skills and other really critical uh, skills, if you will. I was, uh, we were talking one day with a top uh, state government official in Arizona. And uh, you know who Ernie Cortez Jr. is? Ernie, you know, heads up the Southwest IAF outfit in the United States. And I got to watch Ernie Cortez enter into a bargaining session with the director of housing of the state of Arizona. What, what amazed me was that with Ernie, there was not one 
moment of contention in that bargaining session. The way that he handled that was so skillful, so extraordinary. I felt, I felt like I was watching and listening to Yo-Yo Ma. You know, it, it was, it was that kind of artistry. It was that kind of skill. And you know, every time that, uh, and the director of housing was not an opponent. I mean, he was not, uh, he was not angry with us. He was not fighting. He was very cooperative. I mean, in fact, we developed a very good relationship with him. But, uh, and he's a conservative Mormon, Mormon, uh, uh, conservative Mormon Republican. And I watched, I watched Ernie Cortez, and I just had to say to myself, I have never seen such skill like this in my life. So skill is basic to our formation. There's a wonderful word, habitus. Um, I hope you appreciate my artwork. Uh, but, uh, the, uh, this word was first developed by Marcel Moss, who was a nephew of Emile Durkheim. And, uh, and then uh, Bourdieu, more recently, has developed uh, that concept quite a little. Uh, I've been looking at it in terms of Talal Assad. By the way, I think he's one of the top anthropologists in the world. And that is an extraordinary book. And if you don't read a lot, you got to slow down to read it. And it's difficult here and there. But oh my God, what a, what a piece of work. And a person who's either his student or at least uh, influenced by an Asaba This is her study of mosque movement women in Cairo, Egypt. And uh, it is simply extraordinary. These are faithful Muslim women and how they deal with the situation they're in in Cairo. She studies an upper class mosque, middle class mosque, lower class mosque. It's just extraordinary. It's a little, uh, it's a bit theoretical, so again, slow down. But take about six weeks and read it. It's, it's an extraordinary piece. But anyhow, habitus, when Assad talks about habitus, he's talking about how do you form a predisposition to the sensibilities. Remember what I mean by that, the senses. A predisposition in terms of how you see, hear, taste, touch, smell. And uh, a predisposition to the dispositions to the bent. A predisposition to the skill of a tradition. That's a habitus. So one of the things I want to suggest is that, that, a, uh, that uh, formation in terms of justice requires that kind of formation, that kind of development of a, uh, of a habitus. Um, I'm, I realize I'm out of time. One quick story will uh, kind of close it out. There. there was a bishop of Smyrna named Polycarp. And Polycarp is going to be burned for his devotion to Christ and his unwillingness to be devoted to the emperor. You know. And so they're going to burn him at the stake. And when they get him at the stake, Polycarp says, would you please not tie me to the stake? It just seems to be so wrong to have to be tied in order to die for Christ. If you will just stand me, let me stand by the stake, I promise I will not escape. And I will stay there in the flame. And he does. A consumer world says that's impossible. A world where people are formed where they have a compelling way to live, where they cannot live any other way. That is not possible. That's what it does. Okay. What do we do now? Do we break with the group? Do we have questions? Let's or get a question. For that. Yeah, question and answer at this That's point. That's great. Part of the way I approach boomers is there has never been a generation in the history of the United States up to that time that had been more, I would say the word attacked, attacked by consumer culture. 
I mean, if anybody ever went after anybody, they went after you. And I think what you have is a kind of a romantic movement. I mean that in the better sense of the word, the sense of the need to fulfill self and not fit into the logics and the stringencies of what was normality in the capitalism of that day, uh, which has changed, interestingly enough, not necessarily better. But I've got a theory about when y'all quit talking like that. I, I, think I, I think I know exactly when it was. When boomers got 14-year-olds, they quit saying that. <laughs> <laughs> has any of you ever said to your 14-year-old, hey, baby, if it feels good, do it? <laughs> uh, has any of you ever said, do it now? <laughs> when they're wrapped up on the couch with another teenager. I doubt it. Um, what I want to say is this, is that there is in this culture a profound notion of free, autonomous individual that does not exist. Does not exist. But it's sometimes, it, it, with, with boomers, at least some boomers, a great many, it got wrapped up in that kind of romantic movement of doing your own thing in fulfillment of the self. Notice too that when that language entered the culture, there was also a strong sense of human rights. I have a don't the, the, the stop the stop comment when you would get into arguments about this back during the sixties and seventies was, well don't I have a right to do what I want to do. You know? And that, that typically, in most conversations I've heard, won the conversation. What that participated in was a powerful notion of justice as rights. Now, I don't want to be misunderstood here. I'm going to be critical of the notion of justice as rights, but I don't want to be misunderstood, and I'll clarify that in a moment, okay? But what I want to say to you is that basically a Christian understanding of justice is not a justice of rights. Okay. Now, don't misunderstand me. I certainly stand with gay, lesbian folk in terms of all kinds of rights that I think they've been fundamentally denied in our culture. I was an active participant in the civil rights movement and would be again if we were at that place, you know, etc. So it's it's not that. In fact, I think if you stand up for human rights, if you don't stand up for human rights. You don't have anything to argue with the nation state about. And the nation state will flat take your rights away when it's convenient to the interests of the nation. And if you don't believe that, I can talk to you about places in the history of the United States where we've seen that in spades. Okay? So, you know, there's no need to be naive about that. So you do need to stand with rights, otherwise, you know, you don't have anything to discipline the state. Uh, but, uh, I want to say that, listen to this about a justice of rights. The problem with the justice of rights, when, when you hear that comment, and this is, this is intrinsic to that position, don't I have a right to do it? When I please, again, I am not trying to get the state in people's bedroom. The state needs to stay the hell out of people's bedrooms, you know. I'm not trying to, I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, get rid of any, any kind of intrinsic claims that people have on the state or the economy or anything else, okay, but not that. But notice that when you build justice about rights, there's no shared good. No shared good. It doesn't really support character formation. If all you can say is, don't I have a right to do whatever I want to do, where does that form character? Where does it form people as just people? Uh, it does not create community. You know? And it assumes a kind of a pre-established harmony of, of people. That is, if I do what I want to do and you do what you want to do and we don't get in each other's way, then that's going to work for the greatest good for the greatest number. It's that old argument out of, of which, which Adam Smith didn't buy completely, by the way. It's that old argument that if you pursue your self-interest, I pursue my self-interest in a free competition and a free, free competition and a free market, it's going to work for the greatest good of the greatest number. Well, we've seen since 2008 exactly what that does. You know, um, the, uh, the point is, you get that same thing with liberals when it comes to rights. We kind of got a notion if you just pursue what you want to do and you pursue what you want to do, it's going to work out. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. See? 
Again, not trying to deny rightful claims of people, but to say that justice is a whole lot more than the justice of rights taken along. Listen to Richard Hayes, who's one of our top New Testament scholars in the country today, uh, I think, and I think a lot of people think that. And uh, he's not good about everything. Uh, he's been slow on the GLBT issue. But hear him on rights. Thick biblical moral language versus thin procedural rights language. He's talking about that. He says, the ubiquitous appeal of a rationally grounded notion of human rights is without warrant in Scripture. Nowhere in the New Testament is there any hint that housing or anything else is a right. To fail to respond to the homeless in Scripture, he said, is to disregard Moses and the prophets are culpably to fail to recognize Jesus himself. Matthew 25, that's already been referenced. The image of Christ cannot be adequately translated into the enlightenment idiom of human rights and dignity. To replace the powerful images of Christ with pallid rationalistic notions of right and equity is to lose our bearings and our identity. Now he's talking as a Methodist. To sell out Wesley's embodied corporate teaching of holiness to conceptions of rights is betrayal of the Methodist tradition even though Wesley supported human rights. So what I want to suggest is that the deepest understanding of justice in the history of the church is a justice of the common good, all right? not a justice of rights. Now, you hear what I'm saying? I'm not asking you to stop standing up for rights. <laughs> what I'm saying is we need so much more than a conception of justice as rights. Let me put it another way. I think that an awful lot of us on the, can I say the left wing of the church, <laughs> have missed the bet because when we've talked about gay and lesbian, you know, GLBT issues, we've tended to talk about them in terms of rights. I think that the most powerful way to talk about gay and lesbian issues in the church is to talk about the, the doctrine of the family and the, uh, the doctrine of marriage in the church. Let me say why. First, Augustine is the first person really to develop a doctrine of, the, of marriage in the church. You don't have a doctrine of marriage in the New Testament. Now, you got fundamentalists that will tell you to do, but you just watch them. All they can say is, well, wait a minute, one man and one woman. That's about it. You know. Well, that would make up a lot of things. It's Augustine. He says there are three aims or three goods of marriage. One of them is the procreative aim, the procreative function. You say, well, that does it. That knocks out gay folks. Well, hang on. Of course, I know so many gay folks have kids, but nevertheless, <clears throat> the other piece is when Augustine talks about pro procreation, he defines that very carefully. It's raising children for, for the kingdom of God. He does not reduce it to its biological function. Ain't that interesting? Have you ever heard that before? Most folks have. You know why? We don't study the tradition of the church. Especially we liberals. You know, we don't need the tradition. It's bad. Well, you might look at it every once in a while. You might find out there's some pretty good stuff in there. You know. The second thing he says is the united function. You know, now Augustine did not believe in gay marriage. I'm not making that claim. Right? But he talked about the united function. A man and a woman become one so that they manifest, they witness to the oneness of Christ with believers, you know, of God with humanity and the rest. So that's a, that's a basic aim. And then the third one is the sacramental. Now for Augustine, that primarily had to do with the indissolubility of marriage. Now you begin to trace, I won't do all that right now, but you begin to trace the history of marriage across the tradition of the church. You run into some very interesting stuff. Here's my basic claim. My basic claim is when you look at what the church has seen as the aims or the goods of marriage, there's not one of those 
especially if you take procreation and understand it as Augustine did as raising kids for the kingdom of God. There's not a one of those that can't be met by gay and lesbian folk. You look at the Methodist discipline today, and you look at where they talk about marriage, and the conservative figured it out. They said, you better put that thing in there about marriage being one man, one woman. Because when they describe the goods of marriage, every one of them can be met by GLBT people. Every one of them! Why have we not been arguing that? Why have we not? I, I, I was in a TED, a TED here with one of our more conservative, but also awfully bright, I'd, I'd even say brilliant folks. <clears throat> And I promised him I'd never believe his name, but he never, never revealed his name. But he said, he said, Tex, the plain fact of the matter is that handful of passages about same-sex practice in the scriptures cannot support the condemnation of gay and lesbian practice. He said the church is simply wrong about that. He said that's why we've got to insist, though, on the one man, one woman thing in marriage. Well, and then I then you take him on, then you take him on with Augustine. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And the thing is, we haven't done that. What, what am I trying to say? The aims for Augustine are the goods of marriage. See, and if we're talking only about rights, where do we get united? Where do we get, see? You haven't said enough when you say gay and lesbian people have a right to get married. I think they do, but that ain't enough. <laughs> What about all the rich? There is rich. I know that there's sexism in it. I know there's patriarchy in it. And there is also a rich testament to marriage in the history of the church. And why in the world don't, can, why in the world hasn't that been open to GLBT people? So that when they're married, it's not just I've got a right to be married. It's that you can soar and sing out of the richness of what marriage can mean when you understand it in terms of a rich theological, you know, claims out of Christian faith so that the, the, the unity of people can participate in the reality of Trinity. Oh my God. I mean, that is, that is so rich. That is so full. That is so much more than rights only. I know I may be talking about, I'm, I, I, I'm sure in some ways I sound like, well, hey, we don't even have rights and you're talking about all that. Of course we got to talk about all that because it's when you embody that, when you perform that, when you live that, then that's when it's exciting and people say, how can there be anything wrong here? You know? I've been in a church, had gay and lesbian. Some of the best marriages I know, some of the most profoundly Christian marriages I know were in that church. You stand up and you say, ah, oh, you folks don't have a right to be married. You just sound like you're playing with yourself. <laughs> I mean, really. It's crazy. It's crazy. So, thinking about a, a justice of common good. Remember this too about Scripture. We've got such rich tradition. I need about two hours to do this. <laughs> you remember that word? You remember that word, Zedek, in Scripture? Um, it's, a, it's the word righteousness. And the Zadaka words. Do you know that the word for righteousness occurs 523 times in the Old Testament? 523 times. Uh, uh, there's a wonderful article by John Rubin in the Anchor Bible Dictionary. It's uh, our professor of Old Testament, St. Paul, tells me it's the best thing he knows. Uh, Rubin says this. He says, you cannot determine the meaning of of righteousness apart from context. He says, for example, in Psalms and Isaiah 40 to 66, righteousness is God's saving action aimed at shalom. Anybody in here for peace? <laughs> um, and that standing by itself, in other words, when the word stands by itself, it describes God's action. All right. If it's directed toward people, then it's paralleled often with the Hebrew word mispot. In other words, M I S P A T. That's human justice in that sense. And when it's when it's combined with mishpat, it means a just and proper social order, especially a social order for the helpless, the poor, the oppressed, the widow, the orphan, the resident alien. So that righteousness 
and justice. And when you parallel them as you do in Amos 5, you know, let justice roll down like many waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. See the parallel? Then they become one. They mean the same thing. Righteousness and justice are the same thing when they're parallel, though when they're separate mishpah is human justice. And when, when, when righteousness is on its own, you know, talk about God's uh, saving action aimed at Shalom. So, such rich, rich language. Who was that? Who was that right wing uh, guy who said that if your pastor talks about justice, he's a socialist? Glenn Beck. <laughs> it, is, it is extraordinary when people are ignorant of their ignorance. <laughs> or, or think about the kingdom of God and the synoptics and the powerful, powerful notion of the kingdom of God, the reign of God, the rule of God, the basileia theo of God, you know. That, that comes from the word Um I don't know why I look back there. I always put it here. Dekaisune. This is spelled variously. Sometimes it's used a Y, the way some people render it. But Dekaisune. Uh, that word in the New Testament means the righteousness of God. And there's some absolutely wonderful New Testament work being done now. Uh, let me just put up a few names. First of all, you can't beat Big Furnish. He, he hangs out in this part of the world, right? Uh, you can't beat Big Furnish, and, and, and you know that. Three odd people also I find wonderful. Uh, Lewis, J. Lewis, Martin, but spelled different. T-Y-N, has done a commentary on Galatians. Um, oh my, it is just so not good. good. You know, I won't even start reading that book if I've got to do something else because I can't put it down. All right, commentary on And uh, do you all know Beverly Gaventa? Uh, she did a book, these are all on Paul. But Beverly Gaventa did a book entitled um, Our Mother the Apostle Paul. And, and what she, in the case that she makes in that book, I think makes it very powerful. She says, Paul has more female references in his work than he does male references. And then uh, a wonderful book by... What, what's her name? Gaventa, G-A-V-E-N-T-A. And if I were going to do this with uh, 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 some other lay folk, I think I would do Gaventa's book because it's a lot more accessible. Uh, this book is about 700 pages. And you just want to read it for Lent. <laughs> Why not? Just read it for Lent. Uh, this is a couple of hundred. So it's so readable. And Gaventa just knows how to do it. You know? and, uh, and then the, the one I also love is um, Doug Liss. Campbell, and he's, he's, the title of this book, I believe, is The Deliverance of God. Now, what they're doing is they're looking at Paul, and they're saying, what we've done in the West since Luther is we have read the word the uh, the word as, 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 as justification. Wesley did it. I got a new book on Wesley. So uh, I've done 12 books now, but one of them's not out. So, but, um, but Wesley tr translate that word justification. J. Lewis Martin, all these folks say that word needs to be rectification. That, 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 that what, what, what Paul is really saying is that God in Christ has rectified the world by the faith of Christ. Not faith in Christ. It's not first faith in Christ, but the faith of Christ. What does that mean? God has said it right. What it means is that justice is intrinsic to the very act of God. Justice is not something that happens after love. Justice occurs in the very midst of love. Justice and love are not separated. Um, that's too much to say. Uh, how can I say that quickly? What Paul understands basically, Paul is not saying, hey, God in Christ has justified you as an individual with God. It ain't a bunch of individualism. All right? What Paul is saying is that in Christ, the faith of Christ 
responsive to God has changed the friggin' world. And that those old, that old order, those old powers uh, that of separating male and female, you know, of Greek and Jew, of slave and free, that those are now down. Those walls are down in the economy of God. And the ecclesia, that's the church, that's that assembly called out to be the new creation. We are the new creation, not just by fiat. We are the new creation when the walls don't count. You know what I'm saying? So God has set things right. God has made the creation new in the ecclesia. And when you and I are in the ecclesia and the walls are still there, we ain't the ecclesia. You see? We ain't the ecclesia. Now, man, I communicate, I'm trying to say, this one's 900 pages. <laughs> I'm trying to say, what's that, 9 and 9, 1800 but oh God, it reads like a great movie. Uh, <laughs> it reads like a great movie. Just get them and take your time. Yeah. You know, God has given us all the time we need to do what God wants us to do. Okay? So, look, I was raised in Christian ethics, and, uh, and what we... Let me, let me show you the way that the ethicists used to do, some of the ethicists used to do Christian ethics. Joe Fletcher wrote a book, some of you probably new boomers read. You remember that situation ethic? And uh, it kind of got bombed from a thousand feet after a while. He basically says justice is love distributed. <coughs> but hang on. Um, Ramsey, Paul Ramsey said, justice is what you do, uh, what you do when you have more than one neighbor. <laughs> All right. um, um, Daniel Day Williams says, justice is um, the order love requires. Q-U-I-R-E-S. What this new work on Paul says, uh -uh. the justice and the love are one in the rectifying act of God. You don't have to have first love and then justice. Love and justice are one in that divine act. You hear how that works? So it's not a question of, well, how do you make the case for justice? You don't have to make the case for justice. Justice is intrinsic to what God has done in Christ. Yeah. Am, I, am I communicating this? All right, I'll go. Uh, here we go. Now, just quickly then, uh, um, let's look. I, I've only got time to look at one person in terms of the tradition. Look at look at uh, Thomas Aquinas. By the way, we Protestants have got to quit this stuff and not read Catholic thought. <laughs> Especially not reading Thomas Aquinas, you know. You say, well, they got problems. Everybody's got problems. <laughs> Why well, they read us in a thousand years? Why they want to get this stuff right? You know, a friend of mine says, what we did is the capacity to go on. You know, uh, Wesley talks about, do you expect to be made perfect in this life? You're supposed to answer yes, but Wesley, you better. <laughs> huh? You know, so... Um, what was I going to say? <laughs> look, at, look at Thomas Aquinas. And uh, when you work with you, uh, I work with such a great bunch of Catholics in, in Arizona. Oh my God. Oh my God. And you know, and, and if you can imagine this mere Methodist who's actually a renegade Anglican, you know, oh. I'm sitting around and trying to say to him, no, don't give up on the church. Don't give up on the Pope. He's actually written a couple of good things. You know, I mean, it feels weird when I'm keeping Catholics in the church. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. But, but Thomas talks about, he's, he's got it built this way. He says that the kingdom of God really sets up an order of charity. And that order of charity establishes a common good. And that common good is the base for justice. That's in Thomas Aquinas. That's good stuff. 
And I want to I say a little bit about Christian understanding of justice. I'm going to move from this and just describe to you what I think is a Christian view of justice. Uh, and, uh, go from there. Can I raise that now? Uh, the first thing I want to say, and I'm, I'm getting a lot of this out of people like Gaventa and Martin and uh, Campbell. First thing is that a Christian view of justice is justice is redemptive. Okay? But what that word means, we have been so papered over with this blood atonement stuff. This, this 11th century, and it may be a misreading, by the way, this 11th uh, century reading of, uh, uh, I blocked the name. Anselm. Anselm. The, 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 the 11th century Anselm. And we may have misread it, by the way. But what these folks are saying about Paul is, Paul is not talking about a blood atonement. Paul is talking about the, the, the world being set free. That redemption means liberation. Do any of you know Bobby McClain? We have been McClain. He's a professor of preaching at uh, West Sermon. Well, Bobby's been a friend of ours for, Bobby and Joanne have been friends of ours for 30 years. And uh, we were in Washington uh, visiting them for a week once. And uh, Bob says, uh, Tex, uh, Joy and I have a social obligation. Actually, it's an obligation we want to fulfill. But uh, we're, we're going to that tonight. And I wondered if you and Peggy might want to go. He said, uh, the thing that's interesting is the woman is from Mississippi. Well, my ears went up like a bird dog, you know, and, and, uh, and I'm going to make it like a shepherd. And, uh, and he said, he said, uh, she's a writer, and she's done award-winning plays, and she's done a wonderful book on, on her time in Mississippi. And uh, she was a 17-year-old prostitute when the Civil Rights Movement came to Greenwood, Mississippi. And I said, wow, yeah, I think I'd like to go. And he said, I said, let's talk to Peggy. He said, yeah, Peggy wanted to go, so we went. So Bob Marin sitting on this big couch in this tall, Poise, stupid woman reads this stuff she's written about Mississippi. I mean, you know, she talks about magnolia trees, and she talks about pea gravel at the bottom of a clear creek, you know, and she talks about pine trees. I mean, they've got a few of those in the Delta, and she talks about oaks. I mean, and these and these crazy people that populate Mississippi the way stars populate space, you know. And then she, and I am just sitting there. I am in you know. And so Bobby turns around. She says, I think we should take a break. So we take a break. And Bobby looks at me and he says, would you believe that that woman was a prostitute at 17 years of age in Greenwood, Mississippi? I said, you're lying. He said, I am not lying. You are lying. No, I'm not lying. I'll tell you, why don't you go up there and ask her? I'm not about to go up there and ask her. And he says, you know what, Mother? Mother for Bobby is half a word, but that's what he calls it. <laughs> it is a term of endearment. <laughs> he says, you're a chicken shit. <laughs> I said, I am not. <laughs> then go ask her. Well, I mean, he called me that. You know, what are you going to do? <laughs> I mean, I am a Mississippian in some ways yet. You know? So I say, well, so I go up there. And here is this beautiful statement. You know, poise. Hi. <laughs> Hello. I'm a uh, tech sample. Uh, uh, I'm a friend of Bob McLean's. Oh, yes, I know Bob. He's a wonderful man. Well, uh, I, I think so, too. I didn't tell her everything I thought about him at that moment. But, uh, well, Bob and I were... Uh, we were having this. Uh, we were having this conversation after your. By the way, I loved your presentation. <laughs> Bob said, uh, we, um, well, I mean, Bob made a comment about your uh, previous employment. <laughs> you mean that I was a prostitute in Mississippi when I was 17 years old? Oh, dear God, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what he said. Well, it's true. 
That's true. And I said, what? What got you out of that? He said, oh, it's easy. The civil rights movement. I said, the civil rights movement? I said, I was in the civil rights movement, but, but how did that do that? And she said, well, it was in the civil rights movement for the first time. Somebody told me that I was black and I was beautiful. And I said, well, you certainly are beautiful, but how can that be enough? I mean, how, how, how can that work? She says, if you've never heard it before, you wouldn't believe what it can be. And uh, I, I, I was just standing there kind of, you know, talking to myself. That's part of, <laughs> part of the reason I'm not a good conversationist. I talk to myself too much. <laughs> but uh, I'm saying to myself, my God, that's Paul. <laughs> that's liberation. That's redemption. You want to read her book. Her name is, uh, she took the African name uh, Indacia, which means driver. And her name was Ida Mae Holland. And in that book, she tells so many stories. She was the most arrested and the most beaten civil rights worker in Greenwood. And she tells a story about uh, Bob Moses, who was an organizer in Greenwood, had a master's in philosophy, I think, from Harvard, and went to Greenwood to organize with SNCC back in 61 or 2. And, 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 uh, and she meets Bob on the streets of Greenwood one day. And she propositions him. Hey, fellow, I usually charge white guys seven. I'll help you for five. And Bob smiles and greets her and just keeps walking. So she follows him and continues the proposition. And he gets to the SNCC office. And uh, he says, come on in. And she says, I couldn't believe it. When I walked in the door, they asked me what I would like to do. They all greeted me. They treated me like I was somebody. And I walked in the door and they wanted me, they wanted me to take over a job. <laughs> and they gave me a job. And I started working as a part of that organizing effort. I mean, it's just, it's just an utterly beautiful story. You see, God in Christ has broken down the walls. The walls are down. And it's strange, isn't it, how people who, who behave, who practice a world without walls, wind up doing things that are redemptive. Uh, there's a second one. Uh, mercy. Uh, now you'll notice we're not deriving this understanding of justice from the nation state or from capitalism. <laughs> That's why it's very important for us to have a distinctively countercultural understanding of justice. So justice as mercy. Rodney Stark has done a book called, Are We Running Out of Time? Is that why you're standing here? I'm in trouble. I'm halfway through. Um, well, uh, um, hmm. Oh. Okay. All right. Uh, Rodney, Rodney Stark does this book, The Rise of Christianity. Did you know that in the first three centuries of the church, the church grew about 40% per decade? Do you know what that means exponentially? That means that's why in 318 you get official, you know, you get official recognition. And you become, and of course, that's the fall of the church, Constantinianism. But nevertheless, you get Constantine adopting us finally as the religion of the of the, of the Roman Empire. It's kind of like being the religion of the American Empire. Um, well, I won't go there right now. 